Nature's halo Slide so to let our faith shine at noon. Let our faith shine at noon. Let our faith shine at noon. Yeah, let our faith shine at Chris and Kelly, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Well, we're in what has been traditionally known as the Advent season in traditional Christianity and also in unity. We celebrate Advent as well. And it is a time and a season for, for preparing for that time of celebration we call Christmas. And Christmas of, is a recognition of the birth of both Jesus Christ, but it's also a symbolic understanding and awakening, uh, awareness of the awakening of that Christ light, that Christ spirit within each and every one of us. And it comes from a tradition really of, it comes from a tradition of really of trying to remind ourselves and each other back in ancient times when there were no electrical lights and there were only candle lights and fire lights, and that the seasons kept getting darker and darker, that in the middle of this time of darkness, there's a turning point. And that turning point is when we begin to really return into a time of more light. Uh, I can just imagine and think about what it might have been like back in times before electricity when Things seem darker during the winter time. They actually seem darker today, don't they? It's, uh, I shared that you know we lived up in the Northwest, and of course it was like uh, gray and cloudy like this about nine months out of the year. And so uh, I always call it a Seattle kind of day when we have one here in Austin. So we're having kind of a gray day. But as we are in the winter months, there is less sunlight. And Christmas really is also a time of recognizing an awakening and a returning to that spiritual light. It's an awakening of awareness of spiritual consciousness and our connection and our oneness with God, with the divine. And in Unity, Charles Fillmore presented an understanding and awareness that each one of us has unique spiritual qualities that were demonstrated by Jesus the Christ and by his disciples. And these qualities he called the 12 powers of man. That includes humankind, which is also women as well. So we talked a little bit last week about three of those powers, one being faith. And faith is, being, is this energy, of course, of being able to draw into our experience and our awareness that which is in the invisible realm. That's not, not yet in form or shape but it is uh, still there in potentiality, and faith is what helps bring that into our experience. We talk about strength, which is the ability to withstand, to endure, to go through difficulties and challenges, to overcome. And we also talked about the energy, the consciousness of wisdom. And wisdom is an ability to in many ways, know beyond knowing. It is a, an ability to, to recognize truth and to listen to our own inner awareness and inner guidance. It's beyond knowledge. It really is that feeling and that sense and experience of knowing because you know because you know. You know? <laughs> 
So this week we're going to talk a little bit more about these unique spiritual qualities that are in every one of us and, and ways that we can actually develop more of these spiritual qualities so that you and I can allow ourselves to magnify and enhance and grow more into that spiritual consciousness of our unique divine nature, which in unity we call the Christ within. Jesus, of course, I mean, Christ is, as I've always said over and over again, and Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is an energy, an awareness, a consciousness, a state of, of being that Jesus demonstrated to the world. And you and I, each of us, have that within us in absolute potentiality. In a very real sense, that Christ energy, that Christ consciousness is already there in its wholeness, in our unique nature, in the ways we are created as, as human beings. And yet, part of our journey here in life is to help unfold the possibilities of our wholeness in this life experience, to bring it more into an experience and expression out into the world. I think this is really a lot of what Jesus was talking about when he said, you are the light of the world. He was saying that you have that divine nature in you. And he said, let your light so shine among men and women that they may see the glory of God. And that's our work, I believe. I believe that's our whole purpose in being in this world and this experience, is to grow into a, a richer, fuller experience and knowing of that unique divine nature and let that shine out into the world. And there's some wonderful symbols that we see in the Christmas story of the star being a light that's guiding us to that newborn child, which is something that is within every one of us. This newborn baby, the Christ, is being born in each and every one of us. And we're being guided in so many wonderful ways to know more about that, to experience it more, and to express it more in our lives. So one of these powers that is so important and so significant for each of us to experience our unique divine nature and to be able to express that in the world is the power and the energy of love. When I think about going into the, these powers, I want to remind ourselves that we, again, that we are in the, what's called the Advent season. And the Advent season is really a season for preparing ourselves to know more about that to experience more of that. The mystic Thomas Merton wrote, the, adventure, the, the Advent mystery is the beginning of the end of all in us that is not yet Christ. Let me read that again because it's a great quote. The Advent mystery is the beginning of the end of all in us that is not yet Christ. So it's an unfolding and it's also a letting go. It's a letting go of those things that are not really allowing that light of spirit to shine in and through us. I came across a story and thinking about Christmas and getting ready in Advent and getting ready for all of the Christmas festivities and things. And, you know, in, in um, the, a lot of the, the tradition of Christi Christmas is really about giving presents and the excitement of that. And that's, that's a great part of that because there's a givingness in this understanding of our unique divine nature. If we're not in that energy of givingness, then we really are not going to be able to experience and express more of that unique divine nature. So the, the whole thing about giving is a part of that. Chet uh, Rogalski says, I was surprised when my teenage son handed me a Christmas gift because I knew he had little money to spend for Christmas. And so uh, he was, I opened this very nicely wrapped present and I found two AA batteries and a note inside that said, gift not included. <laughs> and there was a boy and his dad who uh, adventured into the woods to, to find just the perfect Christmas tree, you know. They were out there looking and looking, and they walked and walked for hours, and the snow was starting to come down, and they were really examining every tree and looking, and the dad was just really checking out all the trees, and as the afternoon turned into evening, and the temperature started to drop, it was getting colder, the young boy said to his father, said, Dad, I really think we better take the next tree that we see, whether it has lights on it or not. <laughs> 
got to have that perfect tree, you know. <laughs> so I love these traditions, and I love, uh, I love the energy that can, can happen around Christmas when we begin to recognize that they are really, even all of these traditions, the celebration, are about an awakening of spirit, an awakening of spiritual nature, a, a being born of something that is more than our unique, uh, more than our limited way of understanding and expressing more of that unique spiritual nature. Love is at the essence, I think, of both the Advent and the Christmas season, but I think it's at the essence of what we are learning as spiritual beings, living in a human, having a human experience. It's one of the most magnificent adventures. We talk about being an adventuresome spiritual community. Love is one of the most magnificent adventures that you and I can ever be a part of and experience. I came across a, a Tom Wilson Ziggy ca uh, cartoon that says, uh, whoever said you can't buy love probably never went into a pet shop. I really do think that our animals are here to teach us both how to give and how to receive love. They do teach us in so many ways. And, but love is not just an emotion, you know. Love is not just an emotion. It is a, 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 an actual force. It is an actual force of being. It is a force of nature. It is the essence, I think, of what really draws and attracts us to each other and, and connects us to each other and actually eventually moves us into a, an understanding and awareness of our oneness with each other. Love continues to be whether we are conscious of it or aware of it or not. Are you aware of that? Love exists even when we don't realize it. And that's a valuable spiritual understanding if we can really get this understanding that love always is and always exists, even when our awareness is blinded to it, then it helps us to shift out of our blindness. It helps us to be open to the flow of that. And love itself, you know, the, the Course in Miracles talks about the understanding that there's only love or fear. But fear is really simply an absence of love. But what, when there is no, there's something that cannot have any absence, then it's an illusion. There's no such thing as an absence of love. A fear is really our inability to, to see and know and experience love in a particular circumstance or situation. And that's what we engender as fear. It's actually a, a blockage, a blockage to our awareness of the presence and the power of love that's already available and there for us. Of course, we talk about love, and the, the symbolic place in our heart is our heart. And the heart is really a symbol of the circulation of life. And there can be no experience of love unless there's an experience in some way of circulation, unless there's some kind of movement. Love is never stagnant. It never sits still. It's always in movement. But the reality is uh, there's always got to be a, a giving and a receiving in the experience of love, or you don't experience it. It's kind of like, you know, there's always air. You're always surrounded by air. You're living in an atmosphere. There's always an atmosphere around it. Do you realize that? But most of us are not conscious and aware of it until the breeze blows. Does that make sense? And sometimes we're not conscious and aware of it until we breathe out that the real beginning of an experience of the power and the presence of love starts when we begin to share it. We have a tendency, unfortunately, in this world, and we've been taught and trained, to think that we somehow have to go out and get it. But that automatically assumes that we don't have it. And that's a false assumption. There's absolutely no truth in the idea that you have to go and get love. But to really truly know how to experience it when we're in this human place, it starts by giving it. It starts by opening up your awareness to the power and the acceptance of that energy and that power and the sharing of that both with ourselves and with others. 
One of my favorite definitions of love that, that came to me some years ago was reading M. Scott Peck. Many of you are familiar with The Road Less Traveled. And he defined love this way. Love is the willingness to extend oneself for one's own or another's spiritual growth. Let me say that again. The willingness to extend one's self for one's own or another's spiritual growth. And I'd like to actually paraphrase that a little bit. To me, it's more like the willingness to extend or expand one's self for one's own or another's spiritual, mental, emotional, physical well-being. It's a giving of ourself in some way. It's a giving of ourselves for the, the enhancement and the betterment of ourselves and those around us. And the more we are able to do that, the more we're willing to do that. Notice it says it's a willingness. It's not even sometimes just the act of it. Sometimes it starts with just the willingness. And if we begin with the willingness, we will find that ways are open to us for us to express that even more. Came across some wonderful children's definitions of love. Love is like an avalanche where you have to run for your life. <laughs> love is the most important thing in the world, but baseball is pretty cool too. <laughs> One little girl said, I'm not rushing into being in love. I'm finding fourth grade hard enough. <laughs> There are many opportunities and challenges when we consider developing the energy of love, the consciousness of love, the, the spiritual quality of love. Winifred Wilkinson Housing, Hausman, um, in a wonderful book called Your, Your Divine, Your God-Given Potential, gives some wonderful steps for developing love. She says, first of all, there's interest. You need to be interested in something or someone. Show an interest. You cannot love anyone unless there's something there that first interests you. Focus your interest on God and on finding God. Focus your interest on developing love. Seek out the good in all persons and situations. And then the next step is acquaintance. She says you need to be interested enough that you want to get to know God this person, this circumstance, this situation. You're interested in, will lead you into a deeper personal connection or knowledge. And then affection. Affection is that warm feeling that grows within us, an, an awakening or a fondness that leads us into uh, the, the feeling of goodness, of, of the presence of God. Um, and then she says, then, of course, there's attraction. One of the things about love is that love is very much like magnetism or gravity. Gravity is always pulling at us, isn't it? <laughs> and interestingly enough, there's gravity influencing us even if we're in the deepest reaches of space. Are you aware of that? That there are pulls that are going on in all kinds of ways. And love is much like gravity. It kind of holds us to each other. It holds us to the earth. You know that the earth is loving us enough to hang on to us and to attract us and to, to allow us to stay in this energy, in this atmosphere, in this environment. Love pulls us together. It, it binds us. It unites us. And then you move into a step that she calls identification. Identification is a point beyond loving God and loving good. It occurs when you feel yourself one with God. You desire an even stronger and deeper connection, something which will reinforce this oneness in all things, at all times, and in all ways. The Course in Miracles says, whatever the question Love is the answer. I love that. In fact, we had that printed on T-shirts at the Unity Church in Charlottesville, and it was one of the most well-worn. I still have some of those, and it's got holes all in it, and it's still loved. <laughs> and then 
Love brings you into a knowing and an experience of what's known as, been called in traditional terms, atonement. But a more aware understanding of that word is at one Love brings you into the knowing of at one And you really do not move into that experience and that knowing of at one without the energy and the consciousness of love pulling you there. So the next spiritual quality we want to talk about is the quality of power. We open ourselves to the energy and the, and the consciousness of power. It's a magical, mystical kind of sounding word, but uh, it is the gift of the divine, freely given. See, power is that vital energy seated in the, has been called as the hollow of the throat. It's back of the tongue. And it really relates to our ability to speak and say words of truth. See, power in it is, is uh, in unity we talk about there really is only one presence and one power. And that, prow- that presence and the power is the divine itself. And the divine itself is the very cre- uh, is not only the creator of all things, but it is the very energy and act of creation. And so when we think about the spiritual quality of power, you might think about it as the ability that you have to create your experiences in the world. Each and every one of us has this power. We are born with this power. We are created with this power to be creative beings. Another word that relates to power in my mind is the word authority. Authority. The scripture says that Jesus spoke as one having authority. Other translations say as one having power. He spoke from a place of truth. He spoke from a place of an awareness of his oneness with God. And when he spoke from that place, he affected change. Really, I think that's one of the most valuable definitions of the idea of the word power. And that is the ability to affect change, to make a difference, to allow something to be different, to be a part of helping to create that difference. And you and I are gifted with the energy and the consciousness of power. There was one evening a preschooler, Crystal, was, uh, she was with her parents and she was sitting on the couch chatting and Crystal asked, Daddy, you're the boss of the house, right? And her father proudly replied, why, yes, I am the boss of the house. And upon hearing this, Crystal added, because mommy put you in charge, right? We know where real power lies, right? <laughs> but the reality is sometimes power is, uh, we, we think that power is something other than what it is. We think that power sometimes is control. And the reality is we often lose our power by thinking we have to have control. Don't we? See, the energy of control is something very different from power. The energy of control is a fear of not having power. We see this so much in our politics today. There's so much about control. And it's about control because there's a fear of the loss of power. It is not, there's, a, a, there's a difference between the, the energy of power and the energy of force. Dr. David Hawkins, if you've not read some of his works, that wonderful, amazing book called Power Versus Force, highly recommend that everyone read this work because it gives a very clear and just uh, empowering understanding of the difference between power and force. Force really does have to do with control, the need for control. And the reality is the moment that we find ourselves in the energy and the need for control, we have immediately given away our power. Can you see this? Anybody ever 
felt the need for control? Come on, just you know, cough it up. We do. We fall into that. And it's because we have lost touch with that connection we have of the unique power that works in and through every one of us. And so awakening to power, we talk about one of the things that Winifred Hausman says is that we do need control in order to experience power. But control begins, one, with choice and recognizing that we always have that. And one way for spiritual power to flow is by exercising control, not over others or over the world, but over ourselves. Determining what we think and feel is our faculty for awakening the power that is within us. That's the true power that we have, isn't it? And then the next step is to develop an energy, a consciousness of poise. By learning to control our thoughts and feeling, by developing uh, that energy of poise, uh, we're able to control the power that is within us and direct it in ways that are worthwhile and useful and can make a positive impact. The next thing she relates to in the steps to develop power is what she calls a cord. And when we establish control and poise, we are in accord with that divine energy. I would call it alignment or um, harmony, you might say, with that divine power. And then another step in developing power is endowment. This is your first real experience of receiving that spiritual power. It's being open to the understanding that there is something greater within ourselves than our own limited abilities. Every Sunday we get up here in a circle, and before our service we do an affirmation that I think has been one of the most significant spiritual steps that has impacted my life. And that is a prayer that we say, it is not I, but it is the Spirit of God within that does the work. We also say, it is not I, but it is the Christ within me that does the work. In a very real sense, it is a turning over of the control from the limited ego awareness and consciousness, the me and mine, the little me, into a higher understanding that there's something greater that can work through us if we allow ourselves to step out of the way and let that happen. And then she says you move into an energy of dominion. You can command situations and circumstances by exercising dominion based first in your own self-government and always subject to the guidance of spirit within you. You're able to declare, as Jesus did, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And then there you reach a level of experience and of of, of mastery, as Jesus did. You are no longer separated from the very power that you are claiming and expressing. You are, you become that power. Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. Be the power you wish to see in the world. Power flows through you without conscious effort. And you've attained this awareness of complete understanding of you are in the process of creating right now, in this moment. And that's truly the time of power, isn't it? It's happening. You're in that energy and that consciousness here and now. And a part of this understanding is also uh, one of these magnificent divine qualities that we're talking about. These unwrapping our, we're talking about unwrapping our gifts for Christmas, and these are spiritual gifts. And they are often wrapped up in us in wonderful bows and things, but part of our work is to unwrap them and to allow them to be revealed and to have the energy and the excitement and the enthusiasm of that. That enthusiasm is actually one of those, and we'll get to that one later on. But one of the things that I love about the Christmas time is it is such a wonderful, magical time of imagination. And this is one of our beautiful spiritual gifts, one of our spiritual qualities. The gift of imagination. Mark Twain once said, when I was younger, I could remember anything 
whether it actually happened or not. I love the gift of imagination. We oftentimes imagine things that we don't want to experience in our lives, don't we? It's easy to imagine things happening in ways that we dread or we resist. We put a lot of time and energy into that sometimes, and we're being um, led to imagine all kinds of horrible things that can happen in the world by our newspaper, by our, by our televisions, by our, even, you know, even sometimes our Facebook friends. We've been given this invitation to imagine the worst, but we also are always given the, the ability and the, the power to see rightly. And that's what imagination really, truly is intended for, and, and that's what it can be used for, is to see not things as they are, but as they can be. In order to change conditions in our mind, our body, our affairs, we must transform the images that we hold in our thoughts, in our imagination. Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. It is one of the things that allows us to, you know, see, faith is one of the things that draws the, the, the divine substance into our experiences and draws it into reality, but imagination is what gives it form. We have the ability to give form to this divine energy, this divine substance, and we're doing it all the time, whether we recognize it or not. We're using our imaginations consistently, constantly. It's the very energy that gives form to what we see and experience out in our world. If you don't like a condition you are, that you're attracting, then you change them by seeing something different, by seeing a different inner, uh, image in your mind. Imagination is centered in the body between the eyes. It's in the location that's called the third eye. And we see the world not through the lenses of what already is, but through the, the possibilities of what's, what can be. And by, very, by doing that, we are in the process of creating those things that can be an enhanced blessing in our lives. Sharon Luz Ladder told a story of when she was visiting up in the Bouchard Gardens in Victoria, Canada. Anybody ever been there? I know Julie and I have. I love that place. It's one of my most beautiful gardens. She says, I stopped to rest at the wishing well, and several children came up and dropped coins into the well, whispering aloud their wishes. One said, I wish I had a puppy. Another one said, I wish I had a race car. Another one, the last boy, about 10 years old, came up, looked thoughtfully in the pool, and then grudgingly tossed in his coin and muttered, I wish I had a magnet. Yeah. <laughs> Not that that would work, but <laughs> in the imagination of a 10-year-old, I suspect that's what he might wish for. So there's steps to developing our ability of imagination. One is we want to do a cleaning of our imagination. We want to start shifting our energy away from those things that we are imagining that we don't want to happen and clean the erased and erase the limiting thoughts and belief systems that we've been holding, the, the images that we've held about ourselves, about others, and begin to see them differently and see ourselves differently. The next step is consideration. You, you need to consider what it is that you're holding in your imagery, in your imagination. Uh, looking through the eyes of awareness rather than the physical eyes. It says your imagination must be led. With your eyes closed, consider the image you want to present to the world and refine it with your inner eye. And then there's discrimination. You sort out these images and you, you select those that you feel like will express yourself more fully in the world, but also that you will begin to see more of in the world. You look for those things in others that you wish to draw forth from within them. 
And then observation. You simply are able to, one of the ways you keep your imagination focused on good is to observe, to watch for the good everywhere in all situations. If you train yourself to look for problems, guess what you're going to get to find more of? And that's one of the things that we have a tendency to do, is we tend to look for ways, to, we look for problems. And that we're using our imagination to try and find problems, and it's working extremely well. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? One of the things that we do in our board meetings is we do appreciative inquiry. We ask the question, what's going well, and what could go even better? I invite you to really think about it and ask this kind of question in your life. What's going well in your life, and what could go better? And again, holding an image of what you envision could go better for yourself. You are participating in a creative power when you're doing that. Then you begin beholding more of that, and you see as you have envisioned. So these spiritual qualities we always have, but we don't always notice them or pay attention to them. We're oftentimes unconscious, and we're unconsciously participating in this unfolding of our divine nature. And so I invite you during the, this time and this season to really think about the energy and the consciousness of love, and am I allowing it to flow through me, and how am I allowing it to flow, and where can I allow it to flow even more so that I can really tune into that energy more? And then think about the energy of power. Am I owning my own authority, my own ability to make a difference, my own ability to make those changes in my own life, and by doing so, make a change in the world? And then imagining. What are you imagining are the possibilities for you? How are you using your gift of imagination? Are you willing to use that in a way that can uplift yourself, the way you see and experience yourself? And can you lift up your brothers, your sisters, your neighbors, your coworkers, your, your boss, into a different and, a, and a, a greater experience and expression of their potential and possibilities? What amazing, amazing Christmas gifts we have available to us. And you don't have to wait till Christmas Day to start unwrapping them. I hope you'll start today. God bless you. <clears throat> Let's move into our meditation time. I invite you now to move into that peaceful, comfortable place within yourself. Take a nice deep breath. have something in your lap, gently set it aside. If you have something in your thoughts, in your heart, gently set those aside. And just breathe in and out into that peaceful place within you where you are most open and receptive to knowing, to feeling, to experiencing the presence of the divine the presence of God right here and now. And as you breathe in and out, just allow an expansion of your heart in the energy of love and the possibilities of deeper connection with those in life that you love and that love you, a deeper connection with God, the source. It is love that draws us and attracts us and connects us and binds us in our oneness. It binds us in our awareness of our oneness with the one power and allows that power to express in and through us as our unique authority and authentic nature. As a creative being, our authority to create our experiences, our reality, our world.
And as we expand the energies of the heart and spirit and mind into knowing our creative power and presence and love, we allow the gift of imagination to direct our thoughts, our feelings, into seeing a greater expression of ourselves as spiritual beings, imagining ourselves in that Christ light, sharing that Christ light in ways that perhaps we have never experienced before, beyond our limited thoughts of ourselves, but seeing now ourselves as spiritual beings of power and love. And looking around with the gift of imagination, we're seeing the greater possibilities of good, not only in ourselves, but in those around us. The greater possibilities of good in our world. The greater possibilities of good. In all of life. And we give thanks that this wonderful gift of love, of power, of imagination are working through us now. And we allow ourselves to become even more awake and aware and to allow that power to arise in us and express more of that newborn Christ nature within our hearts. Thank you, thank you, thank you, blessed spirit. Take now a nice deep breath. Let that energy of gratitude come in your heart for these spiritual gifts and for the unfoldment of these gifts as we step forward into our daily lives. And another deep breath and gently let your eyes come open and when you're ready, let yourself be fully present here and now. And so it is.